The next item of business is a statement by Derek Mackay on 2018-19 Scottish Government Provisional Outturn. The Cabinet Secretary will take questions at the end of his statement, so there should be no interventions or interruptions. I call on Derek Mackay for up to 10 minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, I welcome the opportunity to update Parliament on the provisional budget outturn for the 2018-19 financial year. The provisional outturn results show that once again this government has prudently and competently managed Scotland's finances. These results are in spite of the ongoing uncertainty created by the disastrous decision to leave the EU, the needless continuation of UK austerity and Tory mismanagement of the economy. The provisional figures I am announcing, I thought I would start off on a consensual note, uh, the provisional figures I am announcing today are set against an extended period of economic turbulence. The global economy is going through a sustained period of weakness and for Scotland this is compounded by the continuing uncertainty around the UK's exit from the EU. Whilst leaving the EU without a deal is the worst possible outcome, even a Brexit with an exit deal will result in significant economic loss compared to remaining within the EU. The UK government's decision to take us out of their EU single market and customs union, the largest market in the world, presents a risk to economic growth, which in turn has an impact on forecast revenues to support our public services, for investment to fund our programmes, migration, our population. Hence, the Scottish Fiscal Commission have downgraded their growth forecasts for 2019, citing continued Brexit uncertainty as the cause. The Scottish Government are using the limited powers at our disposal to mitigate as best we can the economic and employment impacts and to prepare for Brexit. Measures such as committing over a billion pounds to support our cities and regions through the city region deals, increasing capital investment by 1.5 billion pounds per year by the end of the next parliament, and a wide range of other economic and social initiatives. Despite the exceptional political uncertainty, Scotland's economy enjoyed a positive year in 2018. GDP growth was 1.3%, surpassing earlier lower SFC forecasts, continuing a pattern of stronger growth compared to both 20, uh, 2016 and 2017. For 2019, the SFC predicted our economy will grow by 0.8%, as they explicitly point to Brexit uncertainty as the reason for their more pessimistic outlook. I'm sure all members will welcome the 0.5% uh, growth in quarter one uh, of this year. Scotland's labour market has continued to perform well in the first quarter 2019, with unemployment falling to a record low of 3.2%, outperforming the UK unemployment rate of 3.8%. Alongside this, labour productivity grew by 3.8% in 2018, its fastest pace since 2010. So despite the challenging environment, we're taking positive action to transform Scotland's future through the Economic Action Plan. Transformational projects include delivering the National Manufacturing Institute and the Scottish National Investment Bank. Scotland's future budgets will of course be determined by a combination of Scottish and UK government fiscal decisions and our funding outlook for the medium term continues to be dominated by austerity at a UK level. The UK government's macroeconomic policy stance since 2010 has been characterised by austerity. In Scotland, we have protected key services despite austerity, causing a real terms reduction of £2 billion in the resource block grant between 2010-11 and 2019-20. Even Murdo Fraser now concedes that point. The Scottish Government's second medium-term financial strategy, MTFS, published on the 30th of May, explains the fiscal framework and funding arrangements the Scottish Government operates within. It outlines their approach to the financial management and the fiscal rules. It sets out a range of possible funding scenarios for the Scottish budget over the next five years. It sets out a responsible approach to financial planning and the fiscal rules, which will allow us to invest in the economy and protect our essential public services. Turning specifically to the provisional outturn, under the current devolution settlement, the Scottish Parliament, of course, is not permitted to overspend its budget. As a consequence, we've consistently controlled public expenditure to ensure that we live within the budget control limits that apply. I can report that the provisional fiscal outturn for 2018-19 is £32 billion, 
against a fiscal budget of £32.5 billion, resulting in an overall cash variance of £449 million. This uh, variance includes £148 million of Barnet consequentials. Uh, these, uh, this funding was provided very late in the financial year, so Treasury has confirmed that the Scottish Government is not required to carry this funding forward through the Scotland Reserve. Rather, this funding will be held within UK reserves and reallocated to the Scottish Government in the current financial year, 2019-20. Uh, the remaining cash variance of £301 million includes £5 million of additional income for devolved taxes secured over and above initial budget forecasts. And I can inform Parliament today that the total provisional income from land and building transaction tax and the Scottish landfill tax is £699 million and a surplus of £5 million will now be added to the Scotland Reserve. Uh, the variance also includes £3 million relating to the fees in respect of the financial guarantee, which we will also add to the reserve. Of the £293 million variance remaining, £171 million is resource funding, all of which has already been committed in the 2019-20 budget. £1 million in respect of capital and £121 million of financial transactions. Uh, of course, financial transactions uh, funding can only be used for loans and equity investments and entities outside the public sector. So overall, the cash variance of £293 million represents less than 1% of the total fiscal cash budget. All of this funding is carried forward in full through the Scotland Reserve. None of it is handed back to the UK Government, so there is no loss of spending power to the Scottish Government. The £1 million fiscal capital underspend has been achieved whilst prudently borrowing less than originally planned. The 2018-19 drawdown of £250 million is lower than the £450 million initially planned within the published 2018-19 budget. This followed a full assessment of a range of influencing factors, including additional capital funding confirmed in year, and only making funding available to match the actual demand from the projects confirmed in the original 2018-19 budget. And finalising arrangements also gave very careful consideration to building a staggered debt maturity profile. The borrowing in 2018-19 has been undertaken over 10 years, in contrast with the 25 years in 2017-18. Whilst the shorter repayment period pushes up the annual repayment, this is balanced by the lower amount that was borrowed at a lower interest rate a lower cost of borrowing overall, and is affordable in the context of the sum set aside for repayment in the 2019-20 Scottish Budget. It also ensures greater borrowing capacity will be available when it's needed to support the national infrastructure mission. 2018-19 was the first year of the Social Security Scotland Agency operation, which provided over £185 million of support to the people of Scotland. This included over £35 million of additional support as the first payments of the Carers Allowance Supplement and the Best Start Grant Pregnancy and Baby Payments were made. And this year, four new benefits will be implemented to help young carers and low-income families. So finally, and in addition to the above, there is a provisional non-cash underspend of £142 million. The non-cash budget is used for technical accounting adjustments such as depreciation, impairments, and cannot be used to fund public services. This represents no loss of spending power to the government. In conclusion, presiding officer, uh, the cash underspend is entirely retained by the Scottish government, is less than 1% of the budget, makes a contribution that was planned for the 2019-20 budget, and contributes to the reserve, which is prudent, particularly in light of the SFC income tax reconciliation forecast detailed in the MTFS. The figures I'm reporting to you today remain provisional as are subject to change pending completion of the 2018-19 audits. Finalised figures will of course be reported as usual in the annual Scottish Government consolidated accounts and a statement of total outturn for the financial year 2018-19 later this year. And I commend today's figures to Parliament. The Cabinet Secretary will now take questions on the issues raised in the statement uh, and I'll allow up to 20 minutes for that. Uh, would those members who wish to ask a question please press the request to speak buttons and I call Myrtle Fraser. Thank you Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I thank the uh, Finance Secretary for advance sight of his statement. Although we had the customary five minutes of blaming everybody else for the state of the Scottish economy and the public finances before he got to the substance of the matter. Now the Finance Secretary is always complaining about not having enough money to spend. 
But today we learn there is an underspend from last year's budget of nearly half a billion pounds. Half a billion pounds, presiding officer, a very substantial proportion of the overall sum. And meantime, the Finance Secretary has been hiking taxes on uh, Scottish families. Today we learn from the Fraser of Allender Institute that the £500 million extra taxes he's taken from Scottish families has been completely offset by the relatively weaker performance in the Scottish tax base. So there's been no net benefit to the Scottish public services from these extra taxes everybody is having to pay. Presiding officer, I am surprised that in the statement we've just heard, there was only passing mention of the Scottish Fiscal Commission's income tax reconciliations, the projected £1 billion black hole in the public finances, which will hit over the next five years, or in the three years. So in light of this, can the Finance Secretary clarify, firstly, how much of the underspend is in total being put into the Scotland Reserve? And secondly, at what level will the Scotland Reserve now stand up? Derek Mackay. The, the answer to the one, really only one question in that statement, I suppose, was what is the level of um, resource reserve, the fiscal resource reserve, which is what could be deployed to address income tax reconciliation will be at £135 million. That's the figure uh, that, is, uh, that, that is published. But essentially, you see, what happened there is Murdo Fraser, of course, said that I was bemoaning about the state of the Scottish economy and blaming others. I was actually trying to take the credit for the very positive state of the Scottish economy, which is enjoying growth, record high exports, record low unemployment, record high employment. That's all because of the actions of this government, eh, why we're enjoying those strong economic indicators. But I sound this alarm and this warning, and I'm sure all members will look forward to the State of the Economy report with the Chief Economist uh, tomorrow about the threat that Brexit poses to this country and our public finances. So, the resource uh, figures £135 million. And in terms of income tax reconciliation, in the same question, Murdo Fraser said, isn't it terrible the Finance Secretary has an underspend? And then goes on to say, why doesn't the Finance Secretary put more money aside to address the medium-term financial strategy of income tax reconciliation? So it's totally inconsistent, even in the questions that are posed. In truth, we cannot overspend our budget. Actually, if you discount the last minute Barnett consequentials, the variance is less than 1%. It's actually 0.6% of an underspend which has been deployed for this year's budget with a modest amount set aside to address the very issues that was raised at the Finance Committee, eh, which is the responsible thing to do. James Kelly. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, and I thank the Cabinet Secretary for advance sight of the uh, statement. Uh, three hours ago, in exactly the same spot where Derek Mackay is now, the First Minister, in response to uh, a reasonable request from Richard Leonard for proper funding for the Scottish Welfare Fund, told us that every penny for this, in the Scottish budget was accounted for. What the First Minister didn't tell us was that £449 million was being held back in a Scottish Government slush fund. The public... <laughs> The public will find it absolutely astonishing when we find child poverty rising to scandalous levels, NHS patients in pain languishing on waiting lists and real passengers stuck on platforms suffering multiple cancellations and delays of train services, that this money has been kept back in the Scottish Government bank account. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary specifically, when faced with the prospect of the hideous Tory two child cap, why did he not use the powers and the finance at his disposal to use £69 million to alleviate that policy and bring much relief to many families across Scotland? Derek Mackay. I appreciate that James Kelly doesn't need to be consistent. He's in the opposition, eh, not the government, and that's probably going to be the case for some time, I suspect. But the issue here is, to, 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 I, I think the parliament needs to be more mature and responsible when it comes to these finance debates. Only last week at Finance Committee, I was been rightly eh, asked what the plan was to address the potential income tax reconciliations. One of the ways of addressing that is to put a modest amount aside to be able to address those income tax reconciliations. To ask me that question last week and then criticise me for doing so 
this week is absurd. And also, non-cash depreciation or financial adjustments cannot be deployed to frontline services. That is clear to anyone. That is clear to anyone who reads the briefing, the paperwork, and understands how Scotland's public finances are funded. And financial transactions, part of the half a billion pound figure that James Kelly has referenced, can also not be deployed to frontline public services. It's only the resource, the fiscal resource and the capital resource that can be deployed. And in that regard, I've explained that the variance is 0.6% if you exclude the last minute bar Barnet consequentials. And largely, the underspend is being deployed from last financial year into this financial year to protect our public services and deliver the policy commitments for Scotland. And, and finally, presiding officer, it, James Kelly said there was a reasonable request from the Labour Party today in terms of a yet another fiscal ask. You see, the Labour Party change their fiscal ask as often as they change their socks. I can't keep up with their fiscal demands, but I can deliver a balanced budget for Scotland. Yeah, yeah. Now, I'm going to move to the open questions. There's a lot of these, and the front bench questions and answers have taken far too long. So if we could be a bit more concise, Patrick Harvey, followed by Willie Rennie. Thank you. I don't think that phrases like black hole or slush fund elevate the debate at all. But there are serious questions that the Cabinet Secretary is going to have to answer, such as, if the Scotland Reserve is depleted down to 135 million, it is clearly inadequate, even uh, with the, the, the previous year's underspend, to meet the Fiscal Commission's projections. If they are accurate, can he tell us, and when will he tell us, what is his plan for dealing with those? Is it through borrowing, taxation, spending? What are the mechanisms? Derek Mackay. Well, well, here's the nature of Scottish politics. James Kelly says that I've put too much in the reserve. Patrick Harvey says I've put too little in the reserve. But it's also Patrick Harvey that fairly and quite right, rightly at budget negotiations demands that we spend more, secures those concessions, and then complains about the level of resources that are being deployed to deliver commitments that the Green Party and the SNP happen to share. I will, of course, set out my proposition as to how we deal with the income tax reconciliations as part of the budget process that I went over in detail in over two hours, if I remember correctly, at Finance Committee. And I'm happy to return to Finance Committee. But as I explained at that point in time, there's a range of moving parts. It's a complex system. There's a range of factors. And not least what the UK's fiscal position is on spending, on austerity and on taxation that then impacts the decision that this Parliament and this Government takes. Willie Rennie, followed by John Mason. Uh, given the poor daily performance on ScotRail and the abandonment of the target for cycling last week, does the Cabinet Secretary understand how frustrated people will be that it is the Transport Department that has left its resources underspent by the most? Does he understand people's frustration with that? Uh, well, in terms of the areas that were cited, um, ScotRail and rail is not an area where there has been that. Uh, but I'm just for awareness, you know, Willie Rennie has quite li rightly raised issues around rail. But for completeness, that is not around expenditure on railways or uh, the rail uh, franchise itself. And clearly there has been issues around financial penalties that have been curbed uh, because of performance issues that should be addressed by Abelio. It's some of the matters within the transport underspend, uh, particularly I think it is right to focus on that, is due to the delivery of some projects. Some of it will be regulatory, some of it will be the nature of contracts, uh, particularly around some of those road infrastructure uh, projects. Uh, but overall, as I say, on capital, the variance on capital overall uh, is uh, one million pounds. And that's a pretty substantial achievement uh, in terms of the variance at uh, outturn. John Mason, followed by Dean Lockhart. Thank you. I think I'm correct in saying that the only two taxes we have complete control over are land and buildings transaction tax and Scottish landfill tax, which are the devolved taxes. Can the Cabinet Secretary just spell out exactly how they did in comparison to budget? Derek Mackay. Uh, we raised five million pounds more than was uh, forecast for the budget. Dean Lockhart, followed by Neil Bibby. Uh, thank you. The Cabinet Secretary refers to Tory mismanagement of the economy. Can he therefore explain why economic growth in Scotland was 1.4% year to date compared to 1.8% for the UK economy as a whole, and why Scotland has underperformed the UK economy for the tw full 12 years of his government? Does he take responsibility for that? 
David Mackay. I take responsibility for record high employment in Scotland right now. GDP growth is at 0.5 per cent in the first quarter. In many quarters, the uh, GDP growth in Scotland has outperformed the rest of the United Kingdom. Exports is outperforming the rest of the United Kingdom. Unemployment is lower than the rest of the United Kingdom. Productivity is going faster than the rest of the United Kingdom. Uh, investment in research and development is doing better proportionately than the rest of the United Kingdom. On foreign direct investment, we're second only to London and the southeast of England. There are two key reasons why I would say Scotland's economy, uh, in some measures, could be seen as underperforming. One is that the UK government puts all their economic attention, or they used to, into London and the south-east of England, but Brexit will destroy the Conservatives' economic credibility. And the second reason is migration. Migration is an issue in terms of Scotland's working age population and in terms of the economic growth overall. Who controls that? The UK government, who are trying to end freedom of movement, who are trying to create a hostile environment for migrants, and that is having an impact on our economy. But when it comes to GDP growth per head, we are reaching convergence. And in fact, we're raising more per head, which is a success story that Scotland is. Yeah, yeah. Neil Bibby, followed by Bruce Crawford. The, ca the Cabinet Secretary will be well aware that many of our constituents and people across Scotland are struggling with the cost of living. Increasing the welfare fund, freezing rail fares and giving young people free bus travel are just free policies that could help. Does the Minister agree that the Government shouldn't be sitting on significant sums of money when people are struggling? And will he commit to looking at ways to using available money to help people with the cost of living crisis? Derek Mackay. Presiding officer, in the uh, last budget, uh, we committed £42.5 billion pounds. The Labour Party voted against all of that, that record investment in education, the economy, the environment, the National Health Service, extending policies, included, including um, social security payments and many other things. So the Labour Party have failed to put across competent alternative budgets. They have a list of demands, but not a clue as to how they fund them. Bruce Crawford, followed uh, by Bill Bowman. Thank you, President Officer. Now, despite all the predictable doom and gloom being peddled by the opposition, would the, Cap the Secretary confirm that income tax take in Scotland is increasing, that Scotland's economy has strong growth, that unemployment is at a record low, that we have record high employment, and in many other areas, the Scottish economy is outperforming the rest of the UK? I'd like to hear Derek Mackay repeat some of the excellent things he told us about earlier. Derek Mackay. For a brevity, presiding officer, I won't repeat them, but confirm every word that Bruce Crawford has said is true. Yeah, yeah. Bill Bowman, followed by Tom Arthur. Thank you. Given Derek Mackay's income tax changes raised £500 million, and we see the underspend is £449 million, why is it necessary for my hard-working constituents in Dundee and the North East to have their income tax increased at all? Here, here. I, I, don't, okay. I don't know what accountancy courses some members have been on, <laughs> but you know, income tax is resource. Well, he should know that resource is different from capital, and he should know that um, depreciation, for example, can't be deployed on frontline services, whereas what you raise in income tax is absolutely resource, which you absolutely uh, you spend on day-to-day uh, -day services. Myrtle Fraser asked in an earlier question, and Bill uh, Bowman has just followed up, what is the point in Scotland having income tax powers? Because we wanted to have these powers to make our own decisions and make decisions that are right for Scotland, and that includes, that includes a fairer, more progressive income tax system that helps those at the bottom rather than giving constant tax cuts to the rich, which is the trend of the right-wing Tory party about to be compounded with the election of Boris Johnston as the Brexit crazy and potential new Prime Minister. Tom Arthur, followed by Alex Rowley. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In the interest of context, can the Cabinet Secretary state out for the Chamber how this stated underspend compares with previous years? Derek Mackay. Well, it compares it well, which is actually an achievement when you consider how the Scottish Government's budget is growing. There's increased complexity as well. So if you exclude the last minute Barnet consequentials that came from the UK Government, uh, an underspend of about 0.6 per cent, where every penny is retained, and of course it's part funding the 1920 budget as well, I think shows competence, prudence and forward thinking on the part of this Government, if I do say so myself. <laughs> Alex Rowley, followed by David Torrance. Thank you, President Officer. The Cabinet Secretary for Finance will be aware that across councils in Scotland, their reserves are fast running out because they're using them to offset some of the worst of Tory austerity and cuts passed on from himself. 
and looking forward, will he look at services like education, health and social care, where we are heading towards crisis unless we get more resources into those services? When will he start to engage other parties in the budget preparations for next year? Well, my Dennis door, my, I, th I think that's a strange question coming from Alec Rowley, who was actually the only Labour member that approached me with a budget proposition, which was to cut everything else by 3% to give money to local government, which is a fair proposition, but it wasn't one that was supported by the rest of the Labour Party, eh, never mind eh, the Parliament. Mr Rowley also complained, also complained that local government is having to use the reserves, but the front bench finance spokesperson person just said moments ago that we shouldn't hold any reserves and we should spend it all immediately. What a strange contrast uh, in, uh, from uh, the Labour Party. Uh, for completeness, and I've outlined these figures, and it's also in the MSP uh, briefing that's been published, uh, the reserves in terms of the Scotland Reserve is £233 million, pounds, that's £135 million pounds in resource, and £98 million pounds in financial transactions. So actually, Local government's uh, reserves are far greater than that figure, but when it comes to setting budgets, of course, it is only this government that's been delivering real-term increases to local government because of the decisions we've taken against the opposition from the Labour Party, who have failed to give any sort of credible alternative. Yeah. Yeah. If David Torrance is concise, Thank I'll manage to get the last question in. David Torrance. Thank you, President Officer. Could the Cabinet Secretary set out to a chamber why he borrowed less in capital and was originally envisaged? Es essentially, we were able to see through the capital projects that we had committed to. There were last-minute Barnet consequentials on capital that was able be to be deployed, and I took decisions around interest payments and other factors to ensure that we can get on with our capital programme, but do so in a prudent way. That gives us further financial flexibility for future years, and I'm sure the whole chamber will welcome that. And the last question is Gil Patterson. Thanks very much, uh, President Officer. Cabinet Secretary, you won't be quite surprised just how many members of the Chamber just think that we can just increase the budget at a stroke. Therefore, could the Cabinet Secretary confirm that under the current devolution settlement, the Scottish Parliament is not permitted to overspend its budget and that his statement today demonstrated a, consequences, uh, a consequence of that of being a position of controlling budget expenditure to ensure that we live within the budget control limits that apply. Derek McKay. Uh, yes, I can confirm that, Presiding Officer. And the reason that it's important is previous uh, Labour Liberal executives actually handed money back to the Treasury. That's something I'm not proposing ever to do. We'll fully allocate the resources, we'll carry forward any underspend to fund current year's budgets and prepare for the income tax reconciliation. We'll stay within the parameters that have been set out and we'll engage with the UK Government on further flexibility on the fiscal framework because they I surely have already recognised that it isn't absolutely adequate for the financial complexity uh, that we face. That concludes questions in the Cabinet Secretary's statement and we'll move on to the next item of business uh, once everyone is in their place on the front benches. <laughs>